I've titled this paper as uh, Forgetting Memory, Remembering Amnesia. Memory and amnesia are two subtly functioning elements that control our lives. What we forget or made to forget Is that okay? Yeah. What we forget or made to forget and what we remember or expected to remember is what I am interested in. The politics of forgetting in turn leads to the politics of remembering. This game of memory and amnesia make and mar reputations in a given culture space. I am trying to understand what it means by reputation. Reputation is associated with status, position, acquiring power or getting at least close to the power. It is in association with good and bad reputations that one grows up either by representing it or contesting it depending on the locations allotted, allotted to us. My mom was a doctor, first lady doctor for the district and was highly respected in the little town. I grew up. Patients from far came to her. Amma always insisted that I do well in my studies. Amidst all kinds of restrictions, she had struggled hard to acquire education and become an independent woman. Amma used to tell me how difficult it was for her to go to medical school wearing her nine yard sari in a traditional way. Because in the house, she was told that she was not supposed to go to the medical school if she does not wear a sari like that. And um, um, a long skirt which is called petticoat which is worn inside the sari was uh, not bought. Um, she did not have a petticoat. She used to make one by putting her father's dhoti on a jute thread. Amma would go to her friend's house, redo her sari in the way that was common among young people in those days and then attend classes. It was not easy for her to get there. We thoroughly enjoyed the reputation of being children of a well-known parents, while at the same time responsibilities of keeping up to the mark was a bit too high. I first disappointed them by failing to fulfill their dreams of me becoming a doctor. Then it was by opting to study Kannada literature in, in the place of English, because I had opted English and then went and changed to Canada because I wanted to read the classics. Worst blow they had received was when I married an artist. <laughs> and then the second blow was when uh, our son even after he got a very good percentage we encouraged in sciences we encouraged him to go into visual arts which was, which was his passion. Although I was chasing my dreams of becoming a writer and in the process realizing the necessity to drift away from certain lessons learnt conventionally, many a times my drifting away from the expected path you are supposed to take was understood as a threat to the reputation of the family. While it gradually sailed me towards another kind of reputation that allowed me to move towards my dream of becoming a writer. Reputation is imposed on us as individuals, reminding our responsibilities towards the reputation of one's family, located within a specific community, a religion, race, caste or gender identities. That too, if you are not a man, not from a privileged class or caste, the whole notion of reputation gains power to control and direct your functioning. At least in the Indian context, reputation is rooted in the imagined tradition, history and memory that have always been exclusive. This exclusiveness allows 
reinforcing the dominant practices of the high caste Hindus, which is usually Brahminical in India's case, by marginalizing the tribe, tribal, Dalit, women, gendered and other minority communities. Resurfacing of the projected past, which will be present in the contemporary times, linger around deciding things for the others. Therefore, I would like to say in India, past is an active political tool kept alive to reframe the notion of reputation in the present. People and the state refer to the Hindu epics when the idea of rep reputation is invoked. For example, if you have to be a good woman, you have to be like certain characters referred in Ramayana or Mahabharata. If you have to be a brave man, you have to be like Pandavas, not Kauravas. Pandavas are the ones who won but lost everything. Kauravas are the ones who won everything but lost. And so, uh, you, will, you will already know who is the hero and who is the villain. Who and uh, mm, the whole uh, notion of reputation revolves around referring you, your deeds, your life, your characters to something which whether you do not believe it or you believe in. A utopian state in India is imagined through the imagining of a perfect nation devoid of Muslim. When it is imagined as Rama Rajya, even during uh, um, national uh, movement, Indian independent movement, uh, the whole notion of partition or what happened uh, when the partition took over, took, took place and, uh, and the later effects of partition uh, and how it seeps into the contemporary times are all important. When it is imagined as a Rama Rajya, the kingdom of Rama, all men are expe expected to be like Lord Rama and automatically all women will be expected like Sita, his obedient wife and therefore a good woman. The hierarchies maintained within the structure gets a royal consent. Rama Rajya imagined by Gandhi is completely different from the one being imagined by Modi the present Prime Minister and his right wing politics. The pious Rama in whose kingdom there was peace and happiness and justice prevailed, accompanied by brother Lakshmana, wife Sita and Hanuman the monkey devotee, he strived for the well being of his citizens. Now the popular portrayal of Rama is as a warrior. In whichever form one imagines Rama Raja, it, need, uh, it needs a Ravana, the demon god, a villain, always identified as a demon god and his sister Shurpanaka, who have to be tamed and taught the lesson. They are always the other. A nation that was once imagined as a secular space and the memories associated with that is now being replaced by the amnesia of the state sponsored violence in the name of religion and in the name of tradition. All this goes in the name of reputation. Ambedkar, who drafted the constitution of India and campaigned against the social discriminations against Dalits, women and the labor was extremely critical of the Hindu religion rooted in the caste system. He publicly burnt Manusmriti, which is in favor of the high caste Hindus and very mean towards the untouchable castes, recommending cruel punishments to them. Religion brought into politics maintains a distance with other religious groups and keeps them insecure and the moral values imposed in the name of religion controls members within as well. Fire and Water, two films by Deepa Mehta called for a strong opposition from various social groups. In the year 2000, Samskara Bharati, a division of the Hindu fundamentalist organization Rashtriya Swayam Sevaka Sangha or the, or the RSS published a five page handout in Kannada defining the notion of freedom of expression. In this article, there is an elaborate discussion about the importance of the Indian tradition and its Hindu dharma. 
the desirable and the undesirable representations of women and their sexuality within this framework are specified. Along with the director of the film, actresses Shabana Azmi and Nandita Das have also been condemned for acting in Deepa Mehta's films, which are projected as threat to the reputation of Indian society. As an individual and a writer from within and without the context of a tie between religion and politics, one has to face the challenges to contest the past if you have to deal with the reputations offered in the present. Reputation within the literary world is something one strives to attain as a writer. But this is not independent of the kind of reputation I have mentioned previously here. Nanjana Gudu Tirumalamba, the first woman novelist, poet, critic, editor and publisher in Kannada was in the 1920s. She edited magazines for women in Kannada like Karnataka Nandini, Sanmarga Darshini, Veera Mate. She wrote at least eight poems, 80 poems between 1901 and 1902. They are compiled in the collection of poems titled as Bhakti Gita Vali. In an interview given to C. N. Mangala, Tirumalamba has said that these poems were prayers pleading to God to show her the way and calm down the sadness of her heart, which was being subjected to an angry fate. Her first poem in the collection written in these stanzas, in three stanzas, is titled as Saraswati Porayanano, Bharati Protect Me. Bharati is Goddess Bharat, Protect Me. This came out in 1902. Eight of her works were prescribed as textbooks for Madras, Mumbai, and Mysore presidencies between 1918 and 1933. Thirumalamba's poems appeared in three anthologies apart from Bhakti Gita Vali, Bhak, uh, Bhadra Gita Vali, Bhava Gita Vali which was posthumously published in 1988. She was against the confinement of women within the four walls of the house. Thirumalamba opposed child marriage, the tonsure of widows, dowry and uh, pretentious expenditures, especially at the weddings. Thirumalamba glorified the abilities of women and was responsible for generating a tremendous confidence in their strength, love, affection, patience, and sacrifice were some of very important qualities she talked about. These are the key qualities she gives to her protagonists. Nationalism is another area where contribution by women have to be noted. Thirumalamba has a number of poems that invoke the Kannada ness and Karnataka as a nation. These poems have women as central characters. The poet invites her brave sisters to come forward and stand by the country. She says that the women should bring freedom to this nation by encouraging their men to fight for the country and drive out the foreigners. Another poem similar to this kind of a theme is where the poet wakes up the mother, motherland, saying that her is irresponsible sons have all prove, proved to be eunuchs and of no use. Mother, your sons are irresponsible lot. Like eunuchs, they have lost all courage. And the poem goes on. Thirumalamba strongly believed that women were more powerful than men in every way. Uh, her defense of women's capabilities, intellectual power, and their right to a dignified life are remarkable. Masti Venkatesha Ayangar, an established writer, a novelist and her contemporary and also a critic in Kannada language, reviewed novels written by Thirumalamba. Masti begins by defining what a novel is and then moves on to prove how Thirumalamba's writings, both in structure and content, do not qualify as novels. He sarcastically comments on the author's intention of bringing in women's emancipation. Masti also raises questions regarding the portrayal of the women protagonists in Thirumalamba's novels. 
he further points out how the women characters do not cater to the do's and don'ts prescribed to them by the society and therefore are artificial and lack lacking in noble behavior he writes at length about the specific qualities of an ideal womanhood and then the name of nanjana godu tirumalamba the first woman novelist critic editor and publisher in kannada language in the 20s who advocated the women self and argued for the social space for women did not get even a mention in the kannada literary history compiled in the 60s tirumalamba was brought back to light only in the 80s by the women's movement C N Mangala who wrote about Tirumalamba I believe had written an article in which she had mentioned that Tirumalamba is no no more and later on she realized she still alive and they went in search of Tirumalamba when they knocked the door she was in her uh, 90s or eight, late 80s or something she opened the door and said well Tirumalamba is dead and gone from history The Dalit and the women's movement of the 70s with their social significance have been powerful modern literary movements addressing issues around the positioning of women Dalits and minorities in society and in literature Activism that links literature with socio political issues has opened up spaces for representing and contesting the past and the forms of reputations simultaneously thus allowing one to redefine the located allocated social status and move towards or away from the reputation floated by the literary agencies both state sponsored and the ones that function independently criticism is one such a book can be ruined by either giving a severe criticism or no criticism at all to it when my first book of poems was published a critic said that she i mean me she does not write like a woman because there is no sound of bangles in her poetry no fragrance of flowers i started wearing lots of bangles i i did not wear flowers well reputation as a poet depends reputation as a poet depends on how and why one is defined with certain things and uh, when this uh, criticism came out for my first book um the, my first book was very well recognized it was uh, actually um sent to a major publisher uh, by one of the very important kannada poets gopal krishna adiga who's, who who uh, who's uh, called uh, father of modern kannada poetry and uh, always there are only fathers there are no mothers for literature um so anyway adiga um, supported me a lot i was extremely influenced by adiga like you know i used to recite all his poems anything from anywhere any moment you know and i took a lot of time to forget that because it was extremely difficult for me to compose my poems or write my poems um getting um, without getting out of this kind of an influence and uh, yeah um, well then then i i wrote back i mean i responded this to this kind of a uh, uh, criticism saying that i don't wear flowers nor do i believe in the tradition that wants me to wear a flower or a bangle or a bindi or look like uh, someone whom i don't want to and i've tried my best to get out of that and uh, and therefore there isn't th- these things you know and um, if i choose to call myself my engagement with my writing and life identifying it with feminism and activism i will be doing it as an extension of my engagement with my writing when i am identified and categorized as a woman writer i am expected to be writing about women alone mostly and all other engagements of my writing remains unnoticed or unmentioned one of the poet friends used to tell me you should keep publishing if you have to be in limelight because i take a long time to write a poem i keep on editing i keep on meddling with it and 
I'll ruin it and then it becomes a poem probably. <laughs> and I bring back, bring it back to life when I perform. Um, when she said this, I just wonder what is this limelight? This limelight not only puts so much pressure on you to produce, but also threatens you about being forgotten by the readers. Along the image, imagination of a Hindu state, portrayal of Hindu gods, reinterpretation of epics in the narratives, references to sexuality, which re still remains a taboo, all calls for censorship and ban on books and individual writers. And that's increased in recent days. Most of the literary agencies, except those that are initiated by women writers or women activist groups, are all owned by, run by, and the decisions within are taken by men who are mostly from the privileged social spaces. Literary platforms dominated by only men are treated as very natural and you see them and those who sit on the dais, all men don't even feel embarrassed looking at each other. All of them are men. Well, um, literary platforms dominated by only men are treated as very natural. If you are a woman and also a writer, a measured reputation gets stretched doubly. Between the two forms of reputation, you need to break one to make the other. Within my poetic practice, I realize the need to deal with the so-called reputation, both as an individual and a poet. Poetry for me is a tool to question, argue, and put, put forth my arguments as an individual, joining hands with various voices of resistance. The literary reputation in India are built, broken, and measured. And that measurement varies depending on the religion, caste, and gender values attached to it. Now I would like to introduce um, a special kind of poetry, which initially was not poetry at all. It was a sharing. It was a talk. It, it was an active uh, uh, political, uh, it was part of the active political movement of the 12th century, which is called vachanas. Vachana is to speak, to say. 12th century is important because it was the, and this happened only in Karnataka, in the Kannada language. And uh, it's widely been translated. A.K. Ramanujan has translated a book called Speaking of Shiva, which carries four to six vachanakaras in, translated in it. So this is very important because it was the, for the first time a Brahmin uh, discards being a Brahmin and discards all the caste hierarchies. And even women get to write. And people from all um, locations of the society come together and uh, without believing in the hierarchy, they write. It's also philosophical, write for God. And uh, the whole movement believes in uh, the work and the agenda is work for worship, work for worship, work and worship, you know. And uh, uh, they have the signatures, signatures for every uh, poem they write. And when the literary history was written later on, these were considered as poems and they are four liners, six liners and included as poetry, a special genre of poetry. So um, each vachanakara, uh, the composer of vachana, uh, be it a man or a woman, uh, they will use the signature uh, of their profession, the work they do. Uh, a, a, a washerman or a washerwoman would use the metaphors from washing. A prostitute would use the metaphor from her profession. A priest would use from his profession or her profession. It goes on like that. But when the vachanas were put into history, where they were included in uh, syllabi, um, that which is safe for the society 
were included and those which was thought was dangerous which was which would um, uh, kill the reputation of the so called contemporary society were either not translated or not or not included in the syllabi so among them um, are the few vachanakaras whom i would uh, uh, like to uh, read uh, two or three of them um, and you know uh, i uh, when i talk about the translation i am talking about how uh, these vachanakaras and the whole literary movement and the political movement of the 12th century is being promoted and projected beyond india you know to probably to the west of course because it gets translated into english very recently uh, many or most of the vachanakaras have been translated uh, into english and other indian languages and the project is been um, sponsored by religious uh, groups and uh, certain uh, communities uh, which are uh, um, which identify themselves with certain castes um vachanas were even translated but what gets promoted what gets uh, what has been talked about and what has been uh, shown to the world outside are only a few of them Uh, which are who, whose uh, vachanas talk about uh, philosophy talk about they are wonderful vachanakaras who have been projected like basavanna akkamahadevi allama prabhu they are amazing but there are others who are i i wonder why they are not translated um sule sankava sule is the name for a prostitute a prostitute is called as sule and sankava is her name when she writes she calls herself sule sankava and that is her signature sule sankava was perhaps a prostitute as the prefix of her name suggests later on she might have taken to the life uh, of a devotee just one vachana with the signature nirlajeshwara has been traced to her nirlajeshwara ishwara is the god the god and shiva um, because the whole movement believed in shiva which was against the Uh, vaishnavite kind of uh, tradition um nirlajeshwara is lajje is shame the one who doesn't have any shame shiva god who doesn't have any shame ayya once be spoken to a customer i will not be spoken again if i did they will strip me naked and slaughter me it being thus knowing well that he is a violator of oaths if i unite with him they will serve me ha- my hands ears and nose with a searing sword knowing this well i will not i will not i swear on you o nirlajeshwara kalave and uh, whatever uh, translation i am reading is translated by o l nagabhushan swami kalave was uh, and and actually uh, published uh, by um, the basava samiti in bangalore which is uh, um, an institution to promote uh, basavanna's about basavanna his uh, philosophy his religion and everything he was the one who started the movement kalave was the wife of urilinga peddi who hailed from shudra community the untouchable community she was truly dedicated to her kayaka kayaka is the work kayaka ve kailasa kayaka the work is worship work is the heaven that's what they believed and she said i would like to read this bit in kannada and then read the translation uh, this is the original what she wrote kritya kayaka villadavaru bhaktaralla satya shuddha villadudu kayaka valla aase embudu bhavada bija ನಿರಾಸೆ ಎಂಬುದು ನಿತ್ಯ ಮುಕ್ತಿ ಉರಿಲಿಂಗ ಪೆದ್ದಿಗಳ ಅರಸನಲ್ಲಿ ಸದರವಲ್ಲ ಕಾಣವ್ವ ದೋಸ್ ಹೂ ಆರ್ ವಿಥೌಟ್ ಕಾಯಕ ಆರ್ ನಾಟ್ ಡಿವೋಟೀಸ್ ದಾಟ್ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಟ್ರೂತ್ಫುಲ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಪ್ಯೂರ್ ಈಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಕಾಯಕ ಡಿಸೈರ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಸೀಡ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಲ್ಯಾಕ್ ಆಫ್ ಡಿಸೈರ್ ಇಸ್ ಲಿಬ್ರೇಷನ್ ಲುಕ್ ಅವ್ವ it's not easy with urali urilinga peddigala rasa the king of urilinga peddi and here she uses her husband's name uh, 
and addresses to the god madara dhulaiya was engaged in the making of footwear for the sharanas sharanas are the people who were engaged in this movement um so he was a shoemaker who again has to remain out of the boundaries of a so called touchable society the oil in the seed the juice in the fruit the color in gold the milk in the mutton the sweetness of the sugar cane unless the inside is uncovered the pollution of caste is not lost unless the trust in ishta is firmly seen the pollution of stone is not lost unless all this is given up knowledge doesn't become void kama dhuma dhuleshwara yeah and there are many more vachanas though the agenda ideology and the ambition of resisting the caste system gains popularity those that actually contributed towards this remaining unheard this remain unheard those that are though, those that are radical and also fit within the frame get more prominence um, the dynamic of global uh, uh, literary industry is still engaged in looking at the east as an exotic element not enough regional language literature in translation is available in english or any other global languages indian literature is understood mostly through what is accessible in english that which is accessible is the one that is validated by the literary agencies scholars academies and translators who are mostly who mostly follow the tracks laid by the attitudes that are conventional digital spaces seem more accommodative with new and young voices and ideas capable to contribute new dimensions to the notion of literary reputation it has anchored groups and discussions that have been influencing new uh, writing in kannada a writer gets a better reputation when her work works are produced as theatrical presentation sold through cds videos used in cinemas and other fields of entertainments digital space is most layered and cannot be seen in isolation since it is established with the influence and ideas of the dominant actual space before concluding i would like to specify another very important writer from kannada devanuru mahadeva who is an activist and uh, a, a, a dalit writer and uh, i would like to introduce him as a writer first and then his politics as dalit politics and uh, mm, he has been a hero for uh, our generation to conclude in uh, conclude in india literary reputation is a complex state to attain and is a and is challenged with parallel definitions loaded with socio political connotations and um, i would like to read a bit of uh, a poem which i wrote after the godra incident and maybe i will tell you about that during the discussion where um, mm, oh my god okay and uh, i would like to read the footnote of that the year 2002 saw the worst communal clashes in the modern in indian history perhaps next only to those witnessed during the days of partition these riots were triggered by the hindu fundamentalist political organizations in godra which is located in gujarat um, most of the victims were women who were dragged out of their homes gang raped and murdered no uh, period in the history marks this kind of butchery displayed against displayed against women innocent people from both muslim and hindu communities suffered and this poem is a response to that violence har har mahadeva chants from the throats filled with poison rend this bodies poison in the throat seeps into the vein mind's poison rends the body blue spreads the blue across the sky turns the corals and pearls in the oceans depth blue this is the time the cradle of death swings with a lullaby la la lullaby child take care the butcher's knife glistens in the pool of flesh and blood just two inches below the navel sharpness slits slits through before the scream manliness proved and achieved the breast vagina 
breast milk, the monthly blood flow all have different meanings in the politics of dharma. Here, hands, feet, head, torso, love, affection, sorrow are soaked in blood, a wink of sleep for the pain, a tear or two for the hated, a little compassion in the heart. That is dharma. Thank you.